Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're looking at something, well, something that might just flip the script on AI agents. Forget those giant all-knowing models for a second. What if the real future, the practical future of AI agents is actually small? And hey, if this chat gets you fired up about AI and you really want to get a solid handle on it, you should check out the AI course over at rajamanikam.com. It's pretty comprehensive. Okay, so let's unpack this. We're diving into uh, some really interesting research coming out of NVIDIA about where AI agents are headed. Now, most of us, when we think about AI agents doing stuff, you know, automating tasks, maybe handling custom chats, and we picture them running on these huge, large language models, LLMs. But this research, it's asking what if small is the way forward? Exactly. And what's really grappling here is the core argument they're making. Yeah. It's not just that small language models, SLMs, are like a possible alternative. No, they're arguing that SLMs are fundamentally a better fit, more suitable, more economical for, well, for most agentic applications. So our mission today is basically to give you the shortcut. Understand why they think this shift is happening, what the real benefits are, how they tackle the usual objections, and they even give a sort of roadmap for switching from LLMs to SLMs. It's about getting a feel for the uh, the operational and economic waves this could make in the AI agent world. Right. So let's paint the picture first. Agentic AI, it's exploding. Something like half of big IT companies are already using AI agents. The market, it was worth over $5 billion late last year. And they're projecting, what, nearly $200 billion within a decade? It's huge. It really is. And right now, yeah, LLMs are the brains behind most of these agents. They make the decisions, break down tasks, do the reasoning. And the way it usually works is these agents talk back to big centralized cloud APIs for these LLMs. That means massive investments, billions just this year in hosting infrastructure. Serious money. Definitely. And uh, to really get what they're proposing, it helps to understand how they define SLM versus LLM in this paper. An uh, SLM, a small language model, they define it as basically a model that's small enough to run on your average consumer device. Think uh, your phone or a decent laptop. And critically, it has to be fast enough for one user's agent requests. They suggest, you know, as of now, maybe under 10 billion parameters feels about right for that definition. Okay, so small enough for local use, basically. Pretty much. And an LLM, well, that's just any language model that isn't an SLM by that definition. The key thing about these definitions is practicality. Can it run on device? Can it run efficiently? Maybe on tight budget. That aligns with their whole argument. Got it. So here's where it gets really provocative. The core claim from this NVIDIA research is that SLMs are the future for agents because, one, they're actually powerful enough already. Two, they're just operationally a better fit for how agents work, more suitable. And three, they are way, way more economical for the vast majority of things agents need to do. And they're not just saying this might be a good idea. They frame it almost like it's inevitable, a necessary consequence given what the AI community values, like efficiency. Yeah. It's a strong stance. So let's dig into why they feel so confident. Argument number one. Yeah. SLMs are, maybe surprisingly, already powerful enough. We've kind of gotten used to thinking bigger is always better with language models. But uh, things are changing fast. The scaling curve, it's getting steeper. That means newer small models are catching up to the capabilities of older, much larger models, much faster than before. Right. So you get more bang for your buck, parameter-wise. Exactly. We're seeing concrete examples. Microsoft's Phi series, for instance. Yeah. Phi 2, with only 2.7 billion parameters, performs like older 30 billion parameter models, but it's like 15 times faster. Then Phi 3 small at 7 billion is apparently on par with 70 billion models. Wow. And NVIDIA's own Numotron H family models around 2 to 9 billion parameters are comparable to 30 billion LLMs, but use way fewer computational resources for inference. An order of magnitude less, there's Hugging Faces, Malem on 2 series, NVIDIA's Himba, DeepSeek, even DeepMind's Retro. Lots of examples showing small models punching way above their weight, sometimes even outperforming giants like GPT-40 or Claude 3.5 on specific tasks, like tool calling with Salesforce's XLAM model. Okay, that's pretty compelling evidence. The key takeaway, the aha moment they push, is that capability, not the parameter count, is the binding constraint. Mm. For a huge chunk of what agents actually do, these SLMs provide enough reasoning power. Right. So if they're powerful enough, the next question is cost. And this seems to be the second big argument. SLMs are just plain more economical. Running a 7 billion parameter SLM, they say, is somewhere between 10 and 30 times cheaper than a big 70 or 175 billion parameter LLM. That's cheaper in latency, energy, compute, everything. Huge difference. Yeah. And think about fine tuning. 
making an SLM specialized for a task. Apparently, it might only take a few GPU hours, so you can create specialized models overnight rather than over weeks, as they put it. That's incredibly agile. Totally. And this leads to the edge deployment potential, too. Right. Running infants directly on, say, a laptop with a decent GPU using something like ChatRTX. That means real-time responses, it works offline, you have better data privacy. Lots of wins there. Plus, there's this idea that SLMs might just be more efficient intrinsically using a higher percentage of their parameters effectively. And this all ties into a more modular system design, doesn't it? Like building with Lego bricks instead of carving a giant statue? Precisely. You can have lots of small, specialized, expert SLMs. It's cheaper, faster to debug, easier to deploy different combinations. It just fits the diverse nature of agent tasks better. Which leads nicely into the third argument, flexibility. Exactly. Because SLMs are smaller and cheaper to train and run, they offer much greater operational flexibility. And this flexibility, they argue, fosters a kind of democratization of AI agents. How so? Well, it lowers the barrier to entry. More people, more organizations can actually build and deploy useful agents, not just the tech giants. This could lead to more diverse applications, potentially reduce systemic biases because more perspectives are involved in creation, and generally spur more competition and innovation. Makes sense. More players on the field. Okay, argument four. Agents often only need a nary slice of what a language model can do. Is that the idea? Like, we use these incredibly smart generalist LLMs. But then we tie their hands with a really specific prompts and instructions for the agent's task. Right. So the agent is only ever accessing a tiny fraction of the LLM's overall capability. Exactly. So the argument is, why use this massive general purpose brain when a smaller model, fine-tuned specifically for that narrow task, can do it just as well or maybe even better and certainly more efficiently. Use the right tool for the job. Pretty much. And related to that is argument five, close behavioral alignment. Agents often need to output things in very precise formats. Think JSON or XML for tool calls, maybe specific YAML or markdown structures for reports. Yeah, if the format's wrong, the whole workflow breaks. Totally. Now, big LLMs, they know lots of formats, but sometimes they can, well, hallucinate or just make mistakes in the specific format needed. They might add extra text or miss a bracket. An SLM, however, can be fine-tuned with one single formatting rule rigorously enforced. It costs very little to do this during tuning. This makes them much less likely to make those kinds of formatting errors, which is crucial for reliable automation. Okay, reliability is key. Argument six, agentic systems are naturally diverse or heterogeneous. Right. They use a figure in the paper, figure one, to illustrate this. Yeah. You can imagine an agent system having multiple language models working together. Maybe you have one big LLM acting as the main controller, the root agency, handling the really complex overarching strategy. The conductor of the orchestra. Kind of, yeah. And then you have a bunch of specialized SLMs handling specific subordinate tasks, writing a bit of code, summarizing a document, extracting data. Like the individual musicians. Exactly. It allows for this mix and match approach using the best model size and capability for each part of the problem. Okay, that makes intuitive sense. And the final argument, number seven. Argument seven is that agent interactions themselves generate the data needed to improve these SLMs. Think about it. Yeah. Every time an agent calls a tool or uses one of its internal models, that interaction, the input, the output, the context, is valuable data. Ah, like a built-in feedback loop. Precisely. It's high-quality, specialized instruction data that comes organically from just using the agent. You can collect this data like from that logger component in their diagram and use it to continuously fine-tune your expert SLMs. Mm. So making your SLMs better becomes a natural part of just running the agent system, not some separate massive undertaking. Okay, that's a really compelling suite of arguments for SLMs, but uh, surely there are counter-arguments, right? What about the people who say LLMs will always be king? Absolutely. Let's tackle those. The first big alternative view is basically LLM generalists always win. This usually comes down to two things. First, scaling laws. The idea that bigger models just inherently understand language better across the board because of their sheer size. More data, more parameters, better understanding. Right. And second, there's this concept of a semantic hub in large models, a sort of central processing area for meaning that supposedly gives them superior abstract reasoning capabilities, even for simple tasks. Okay, so how does the research rebut that? Well, several points. Regarding scaling laws, they point out that those studies often assume the model architecture stays the same as you scale up. But 
SLM development is using new, more efficient architectures. So it's not an apples to apples comparison just based on parameter count. Different design. Exactly. Also, SLMs can be fine-tuned very cheaply and effectively for specific tasks, which dramatically improve their performance on those tasks, something general scaling laws don't really account for. And yes, reasoning might be better in LMs in general, but it's also vastly more expensive. For the level of reasoning needed in many agent subtasks, SLMs are sufficient and much cheaper. And the semantic hub idea. The argument there is that the semantic hub is likely most beneficial for really complex, nuanced, open-ended reasoning. But agentic systems are often about breaking down complexity into simpler, manageable subtasks. For those simpler tasks, that high-level abstract understanding is less critical. An SLM's focused capability is enough. Okay, that makes sense. Fit for purpose again. What's the next counter-argument? The second alternative view is about economics. But from the other side, it argues that the sheer economy of scale you get from massive, centralized LLM inference farms might actually make them cheaper overall, even if SLMs are cheaper per token. Ah, the Amazon Web Services argument, basically. Centralization wins. Kind of. They suggest it might be too difficult or inefficient to manage lots of different SLM endpoints compared to one big LLM API. Plus, setting up decentralized SLM infrastructure might require specialized talent and high initial costs. So how do they respond to that? Well, they acknowledge it's a valid point and say the jury is still out on the final economic tally. But they counter by pointing to rapid progress in things like inference scheduling. Tools like NVIDIA's Dynamo are making it much easier to manage and efficiently run diverse sets of models, mitigating those load balancing and utilization challenges. So technology is catching up to manage the complexity. Exactly. And they also note that the general trend for infrastructure setup costs, including the hardware and software needed for SLMs, is consistently going down. Okay. And the last alternative view, the inertia argument. Yeah, basically that the LLM world just has too much of a head start. There's existing infrastructure, established workflows, industry momentum. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just too hard for SLMs to displace LLMs now regardless of the technical merits. A practical barrier. Right. And they acknowledge this is a distinct possibility. Inertia is powerful, but they reiterate their core belief that the combined weight of all the advantages for SLMs, the power, economy, flexibility alignment is strong enough that it can plausibly overcome this inertia, especially driven by the economic benefits. Okay. So if the case for SLMs is strong, but there's inertia, what are the specific barriers holding back wider adoption right now? Why isn't everyone rushing to SLMs? The research highlights three main practical hurdles. First, as we just touched on, the significant upfront investment already sunk into centralized LLM infrastructure. Companies have made big bets, built tools around them. Switching costs are real. Path of dependency. Exactly. Second, there's an issue with how SLMs are often developed and evaluated. They tend to follow the LLM playbook, focusing on generalist benchmarks. But they argue SLM development should focus more on benchmarks that measure agentic utility, how well they perform specific agent tasks. They even cite other research showing SLMs do outperform larger models when judged on those specific metrics. So we're maybe measuring them the wrong way. Could be part of it. And the third barrier is simply awareness. LLMs get all the headlines, the big marketing pushes. SLMs, even if highly effective for certain jobs, just don't have the same public profile or perhaps internal advocacy within organizations yet. Okay, infrastructure inertia, benchmark misalignment, and lack of awareness. But crucially, they emphasize that these are practical hurdles, not fundamental flaws in the SLM approach itself. Advancements like Dynamo chip away at the infrastructure barrier. Awareness is growing about the benchmark issue, and the awareness barrier will likely fall as the economic wins become undeniable. Right. So assuming a company wants to make this shift, how do they actually do it? You mentioned a conversion algorithm. Sounds practical. It is. They lay out a pretty clear step-by-step -step process for migrating agent tasks from LLMs to SLMs. Step one, secure usage data collection. You need to log everything your agent does internally when it's not interacting with a human. So the prompts it sends to language models, the responses it gets back, any tool calls it makes, even things like how long each step took. And crucially, do this securely, encrypt the data, anonymize it. Like setting up really good internal monitoring for the agent. Exactly. That logger in there, figure one again. <laughs> Step two is data curation. Once you have a decent amount of data, they suggest maybe 10K to 100K examples, you need to clean it. The big thing here is removing any sensitive data like personal info or private company details. Automated tools get pretty good at this. Okay, data hygiene. Then what? Step three, task clustering. 
You take all those logged interactions and use uh, unsupervised machine learning techniques to find patterns. Group together similar types of prompts or actions. This helps you identify the recurring, distinct tasks the agent performs, maybe recognize user intent, extract specific data, summarize this text, generate that code snippet. These clusters define the specific jobs you'll want specialized SLMs for. Got it. So you figure out the common subtasks. Right. Step four is SLM selection. For each task cluster you identified, you pick one or more candidate SLMs. You'd choose based on, well, does the SLM have the right capabilities? How does it score on relevant benchmarks? What's its license? How much compute does it need? You'd look at models like the Phi series, Nemotron H, the ones we mentioned earlier. Matching the tool to the task. Precisely. Then comes step five, the core of it. Specialized SLM fine-tuning. You create task-specific data sets from your curated logs for each chosen SLM. Then you fine-tune the SLM on that specific data. And this is where techniques like PEFT, parameter-efficient fine-tuning, using methods like LoRa or QLoRa are key. Why are they key? Because they let you adapt these pre-trained SLMs very efficiently, without needing massive amounts of compute or retraining the whole model from scratch. It makes specialization affordable. You can even use knowledge distillation, having the original LLM help teach the SLM. Smart. So specialized training, is that the last step? Almost. Step six is iteration and refinement. It's not a one and done thing. You need a continuous loop. Keep collecting data, periodically retrain your specialized SLMs and any router models that decide which SLM to use so they stay sharp and adapt as usage patterns change. Continuous improvement. Can you give some real world examples like how would this apply to agents we might know? Sure. They look at a few popular open source agents. A meta GPT, for example, which simulates a software company, they estimate maybe 50% of his current LLM calls things like generating routine code, boilerplate text, ensuring structured output could potentially be handled by specialized SLMs. 60%, that's substantial. It is. Or take open operator, used for workflow automation. Maybe 40% of its LLM use for simpler command parsing or generating standard messages could shift to SLMs. And Cradle, an agent for controlling graphical interfaces on a computer. Mm. They estimate maybe 70% could be SLMs handling repetitive clicks or pre-learned sequences. Wow, 70%. Yeah. Now, this doesn't mean SLMs do everything. The really complex stuff, high-level architectural reasoning in MetaGPT, mm -hmm. multi-step planning in Open Operator, adapting to totally new GYs in Cradle might still require a more powerful LLM. So it's about that heterogeneous mix again using the right size model for the right part of the job. Exactly. Strategic deployment. Okay, so wrapping this up, what's the big picture takeaway here? This idea of SLMs taking over for agents it really challenges the status quo, doesn't it? It yeah. suggests a future for AI that's maybe more efficient, more adaptable, and potentially more democratic. I think that's a fair summary. The researchers behind this are explicitly calling for discussion, for contributions, but also for critique. Their goal seems to be genuinely about advancing efforts to make AI more accessible and cost-effective. And it leaves you with a pretty provocative thought, right? If powerful AI can become small enough, efficient enough, to run not just in giant data centers, but maybe on our phones, our laptops, devices all around us, what kind of entirely new applications does that unlock? How does that change, you know, just our daily interaction with technology? It's a huge question, yeah. and it leads to others. Like, how does the industry actually manage this shift if it happens? What's the role for developers, for businesses, in maybe accelerating SLM adoption? It's definitely a fascinating space to watch. And uh, if you find yourself really drawn into this evolving world of AI, wanting to get deeper into the concepts and the cutting edge, remember you can explore that comprehensive AI course over at rajamanikam.com. It really helps build that foundational understanding. Definitely worth checking out. Well, that's our deep dive for today. Join us next time on The Deep Dive, where we'll unpack another stack of insights just for you.